Okay. Uh, if, you all, if everybody else right now would go ahead and star six, mute yourself out, okay, until I'm done going over what I've got to say here, okay? Thank you. Okay. Uh, I told people to basically go and pull down the document that I had you post up there, Tom, that uh, was dealing with the Hague Conference uh, document about Apostille. Okay? Because I'm going to go over that, and it's got some very important information on that little document. Okay. You have basically uh, U.S. competent authorities, okay, for a document and seal originating within the federal executive or administrative agencies, counselor or military documents, the authority to affix the apostille rest with uh, the United States. Department of State. Okay. Now, you also have down below for a document slash seal originating from US U dot S dot courts, comma. The authority to affix the apostille resides with the clerks and deputy clerks of the federal court system. Well, that is two different court systems. The U.S. dot stands for United States of America courts, not the federal courts. Okay? The constitutional courts not the statutory federal courts. So a document originating under seal from a U.S. court then goes to the federal courts to get apostilled. Now, we are going over uh, on Friday night about territorial uh, jurisdiction of being an unincorporated or an incorporated territory. They have gotten us into a our assets into an incorporated territory okay, under the Certificate of Live Birth and under the Military TD-214. Those then fall under uh, their jurisdiction. But what jurisdiction do they fall under? Well, they fall under an item called a mutual uh, easement. Okay? A mutual easement, okay, is... If you look it up in the dictionary, mutual easements, servitudes arising upon the acceptance by the grantee of a deed containing a covenant binding both the grantor and the grantee. That was what they tried to place us under was under a territorial servitude. And if you've got a grantor and a grantee, you've got to have a third party, and that third party is the beneficiary. So we are in servitude to the beneficiaries. And that was under... And mutual easements. You need to go through all the words or all the definitions in the dictionary that begin with mutual. 
okay? It's a mutual benefit society. Okay? Our certificate of live birth is a mutual benefit certificate. A certificate of membership in the mutual benefit society. Now, the controlling entities of this mutual benefit society are operating under the lodge system. The lodge system you have is the bar, the men in black, the black robes, the bar. You also have the Freemasons in this endeavor. The Scottish Freemasons or whatever society here in this country. Then you have, uh, also you have a mutual benefit society if you got a baptismal certificate from a church. That placed you under a mutual uh, easement to the church. And it was supposed to be a mutual benefit society. That church was. Now. But they're also called a fraternal A mutual benefit society is also called a fraternal beneficial society. Okay? What is fraternal? Well, you have to break the word down. FR is the abbreviation for fractional, often used in descriptions of real estate. Skip the A, go to the next item, which is T-E-R-N. Something in three. And then the last part is a L for a long time. A and L in long. That's what a L stands for, a long time like 999 years. That's a long time. But like in personnel, okay, that is for a lifetime, which hopefully is a long time and not ending tomorrow. You have fraternal insurance under this fraternal beneficial society. Mutual life, accident, health insurance, which is issued to their members by fraternal orders or societies. So basically we have a mutual insurance company out here, and that's the state insurance company. But it's a mutual life insurance company because they're holding our assets, our assurance assets, as the initial deposit against that insurance policy. We were never supposed to have to put any more premiums in against that policy. But they, in all their endeavors, they turn around and try and get us to put more premiums in against the insurance policy in the form of taxes in the form of traffic tickets, fines, bonds, appearance bonds, you name it. Those are all going in as premiums 
into that mutual life insurance company. And then as the fraternal order, the bar members, the Scottish Freemasons, upper level, and like the church, they're all drawing off items out of that as beneficial compensation. Now, a mutual life insurance company, okay, a life insurance company, which while operating upon an old line basis, and this old line basis goes all the way back to Moses' time. That's what the pharaohs were operating under. A mutual life insurance company against being dead. That is out of the book of debt, of the dead. Now, that life insurance policy has a cash surrender value. And we can terminate any life insurance policy. But you have to go about it the right way. And the right way is that you have your three persons, or there are the three entities that are over this uh, mutual life insurance policy. The grantor, the grantee, and the beneficiaries. Now, it was done by mutual mistake. You can look these all up in uh, Ballantyne's Dictionary. Okay? By reason of which each party has done what neither intended. So that's a mutual mistake. Neither your grantor nor the grantee intended this thing to be what it is. Because you were not given full disclosure. Now the kicker here is that basically you can come in under mutual wills. and sometimes called twin wills, wills executed pursuant to an agreement between two or more persons to dispose of their property in a particular manner, each in consideration of the other. And there is a template that you have to modify the template that's in that 600 uh, legal package that I had Tom post up there. I think it's under estates, and it's called, uh, well, let's see, what was it called? I still got the title up there. It was called a joint and mutual will. But I'm modifying it to be a territorial tribunal will. That means it's going to have three parties to this will. The first party will be the grantor. In my case, Patrick no middle name, divine. Just as it appears on the membership document. The second party will be the grantee, Mr. Patrick, semicolon divine. Now the part, third parties, 
are the beneficiaries. In my case, one is known as the state of Iowa, and the other, in my case, is the Roman Catholic Church, Church of Rome. Now, back to the court, because you're going to have to send this into a court. Well, what court do you have to send this into? The court you have to send your, and you do this, and this is what one bankruptcy judge down in South Carolina told a couple guys down there. You can do this yourself. Well, how can we do this ourselves? Because we have the territorial jurisdiction. We are a territorial judge. The judge of a court of a territory of the United States of America. So you are a territorial judge also. You're also a territorial governor. So you have to have your territorial court. Now, you have to properly identify your court. Okay? The three elements of a court are a time, a place, and a person. But you have to have a competent jurisdiction, the power and authority of law at the time of acting to do the, the particular act. Now, I was in one of the definitions, and I'm just not seeing it right now that basically you have to identify uh, the court, and then you also have to identify the jurisdiction. So on my uh, document, and you can listen to this over several times so you get this down right, the name of my court is the Patrick Divine Territorial a state U dot S dot superior court. Okay, did everybody get that? The your name territorial estate U dot S dot superior court. having the lawful territorial estate jurisdiction. Okay? This court is basically addressed and implied in some regards into the Constitution. And also reiterated by uh, the Ninth and Tenth Amendment amendments to the Constitution. Your free people, your name, territorial estate, U dot S dot Superior Court, it's not a Supreme Court, it's a Superior Court, is the first in line court And you've heard the term, first in line is first in time. So it's the first in line court in the United States of America constitutional court system out here. But it is not under the controls of the federal court system because it stands as a superior court 
to all federal and state courts. You, when you do this right, you stand superior to all federal and state courts unless you have actually caused physical harm to somebody out there. None of their codes apply to you. The codes of law only apply to the federal and state court systems. Also, another word for our court is, and you can find this in the Bible, is God. As both have the superior authority to issue lawful and just judgments dealing with our, in our case, American territorial estate jurisdictions. That's why on your court orders, out of your court, you say by this court and God, this judgment is issued. And see, that puts you in a total superior authority standing over these fictional federal and state courts. You can go into competent jurisdiction definitions, okay? I would go through all of the mutual definitions, all of the competent definitions, knowing what a competent person is. A capable person, a person legally qualified by age and mental capacity. But now you have two subcategories there, competent attesting witness and competent witness. They're coming in in two different capacities. The competent attesting witness will be the one that is acting as basically the uh, authorized representative for your fictional person. You are the competent witness operating for your yourself as the grantee. A competent court, a tribunal having jurisdiction... Well, our territorial court is a tribunal having jurisdiction, so it's a competent court. A court legally constituted. Our court is legally constituted. A court, the judgments and proceeding of which are not open to collateral attack. When our ruling is done, it's done. Just don't get carried overboard and do something that basically is not right. Okay? A court created without color of authority. That's what a competent court is. Well, all the federal courts and all the state courts are with color of authority. So they're not competent courts or a mere usurper like some of these courts are and basically like the bankruptcy court. It's an usurper. Not within the definition of a competent court. But a de facto court is a competent court. And see, you are a de facto court by law. Court of general jurisdiction. 
a term, a, a term sometimes equated to or with court of record, a court of extens, extension, extensive, although not necessarily limited jurisdiction, a superior court. Doesn't say a federal court, doesn't say a uh, Supreme Court. It says a superior court. Well, there's only a couple other states out here that have tried to absorb using the word superior in their state court system. You do not have superior court in the federal court system. Because that one is reserved for us, for our superior court, because we have God on our side. Superior court, a term applied to courts of general jurisdiction, generally. In some jurisdictions, the title of a court of general jurisdiction. In others, a title of appellate court. And in still others, the title of a municipal or county court. But see, that is all under codes in a lot of cases. But that doesn't make them a superior court. Now, you have to be competent to be superior. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, they had mutual wills. Okay. Wills executed with a. We can barely hear you. Back off, Steve, please. Okay. I told everybody to mute out. Okay. Uh, Mutual wills, okay? Wills executed with a common intention on the part of the testators, irrespective of whether there is a contract between them. Well, see, I'm going for a tribunal will, and this one isn't in the dictionary. And this one will be a ruling by the court. A ruling, the ruling wills of at least two of the three to allow your court to issue its judgment. We don't need the beneficiaries in our court whatsoever, and they will not be there because our grantor and grantee, okay, our competent. Uh, a testing witness for our grantor, and we, as the uh, competent witness, we can take an oath of truth. But the beneficiaries, the state of Iowa and the Church of Rome or the Roman Catholic Church, they can't come into our court and take that oath because they're bound by other oaths to lie their ass off, to not tell the truth. Now, everybody wondered why you would be getting a visit from the men in black. Well, basically, all of these beneficiaries are dressed in black. The church ministers, their secret societies, they're all in black. The Bar Association secret society is all in black. The Knights nice Temp or the Scottish Freemasons, basically they're black ops. 
Now, you have, you're going to get a visit from these guys, and it's going to be sort of a threatening visit in a way. If you go the whole gambit on this process, and the outcome, if you do not comply with what they demand from you, can lead to, basically, what happened to John the Baptist. Beheading. See, John the Baptist spilled the beans to Jesus, to his cousin. That's why he lost his head. That's why a couple of these presidents, because they were trying to spill the beans to the general populace of the country. And in some regards, one of the guys said, you know, I think that we are already on the blacklist. Well, I can see that we probably are on the blacklist from half the stuff that I've done out here. But that doesn't stop there. We have still protected rights. Now, we will probably get a visit when we cash out our uh, mutual insurance policies and they will come and tell us, basically, keep your mouth shut because you basically expose our trade secrets and certain ramifications will come down upon you. That is what (laughs) the men in black will come. (laughs) In other words, you're going to, they're going to tell you to keep your damn mouth shut because you expose them, you expose their trade secrets and now the cat's out of the bag. See, I'm trying to do this ahead of time. That's what the man Jesus tried to do ahead of time also. Before he went and went the route of getting out. And it was by his will in the position of grantor and grantee that he overrode the fraudulent wills of the beneficiaries because they could not stand in the court. Moses did the same damn thing. But it took him a little while to get his ducks in a row, just like it has us. I've tried to send court orders into the court, but I was operating under, I didn't have the proper title, and I didn't have the proper uh, identification for my jurisdiction. I went back through one of the court orders that I got back from uh, the United States Court of Federal Claims. Back that was filed back in uh, September 30th, 2010. I forget what date it came back on. Uh, but anyway, it came back and said, uh, uh, this claim, okay, basically I was trying to claim my DD-214 and uh, several other items. But they came back and said uh, that their claim accrued no later than 1978, well beyond the six-year period described in 28 U.S.C. Section 2501. Thus, 
the court lacks jurisdiction over the plaintiff's complaint on statutes of limitation. That is in the federal court system. That is not in the de jure superior court system. Per the Constitution, there is no statute of limitation upon fraud. So, don't buy into that. You don't operate under the codes of law. Only the federal courts and the federal employees operate under the codes of law. You operate under the Bible and the Constitution. See, sometimes you have to go back and look and see what the court is actually saying to you. Just like the guys down in South Carolina. I talked to them today. And we went over what that bankruptcy judge was trying to tell them. He was trying to give them every opportunity to issue an order to the court. They had to issue the order. Well, I can see some of that from some of the court cases that I have done. I basically have issued orders to the court, and basically the court complied with my orders. But I didn't need to do half of what uh, the item was, traffic tickets. We can override them either by pardon as a territorial governor or by way of the court, our court, to issue an order to their court because we're a superior court and we can even order that judge into chambers. We're the superior court. They're a fraud in most cases. But you have to utilize it and not be belligerent about the whole process. Because then that shows that you're not really competent, that you are just a belligerent. And belligerency begets belligerency. And they've got bigger guns than you do in the war of belligerencies. I like to make up some of my own words. So, you have to do a will, and you basically present it into your court, and then your court can rule upon it and make the uh, uh, issue the judgment upon the item, and then basically, or direct the clerk, your clerk of the court, and see, you don't go to a notary public. Your clerk of the court is your notary public for your territorial estate jurisdiction. Okay? Your tribunal seal, you should have one of those or get one in the process. Two out of three. And then that's your court seal. These are private. This is a private court. You can keep your private records. So it's a court of record. Private records. You have your clerk of the court write out the orders and issue the orders to 
the other court or to the other judges. Or to the attorney general. Or to the treasurer of the state. Or to the secretary of the state. As a territorial estate, U.S. Superior Court. Now, if they do not comply, some of these other people, but basically the court system, they will because basically in most cases, uh, one of those judges is sitting there as a du jour U.S. court, district court judge, or circuit court judge, or supreme court judge. They're in the U.S. court system. Now, the U.S. federal district court judge, that is in the fictional or the fraudulent court system. But no matter what it is, you are still the first in line court in the United States of America constitutional court system. Because you are one of we the people that created and established the court system to begin with. And basically, a creation cannot override the creator. So that's why you are also the superior court. But just don't go out there and harm anybody because then you're now join yourself at their mercy in the real law system. You stay in honor, and basically down the road, we will start getting the honor that is due to us. But you have to fight for it. All of your receipts that you have, you can take those into your court, present them into your court, have the court rule upon them, and issue out the order coming from your court to the Attorney General's office to make the settlement for all of those receipts because those receipts were supposed to be paid out of the insurance policy, the mutual beneficial insurance policy. It was supposed to be a mutual benefit for the grantee as well as the other state and church beneficiaries. But you can come in with your two out of three tribunal will into your court and order the revocation and liquidation of those insurance policies and membership in that Mutual society. And then they've got to settle up the books. It's just like if you have a life insurance policy with a regular insurance company out here. And I've done this several times with them. And then I finally got wise to it and stopped getting whole life insurance policies. I said, you know, this is ridiculous. 
for me to pay money out of my back pocket that basically I'm not going to have any benefit from after I die. After I die, I don't give a shit what happens. I'm dead. Stop trying to take care of everybody else. They've got their own stuff. They've got to take care of themselves. As soon as they turned 21, they were on their own. Now, you can give a friend, a neighbor, a helping hand now and then. Okay? But that is not what I'm talking about here. These in, the worst thing that ever happened to this country in 1887 was when they brought insurance into this country. And see, that is the deceptive side of banking. The usury side. The bankers themselves, if they were operating with just currency of exchange, did not harm this country. But the insurance side of the banking system has basically destroyed this country. So, you can turn around and then you uh, put your order into the Attorney General's office of your birthing state to the Vicar General of the Church that you are ordering uh, the termination of those uh, mutual easements and the liquidation of the insurance, the life insurance policies. Because if you don't take those life insurance policies out, they will stay on the books for 999 years. A fraternal society does not necessarily operate for the benefit in its immediate lifetime. And basically that's how they've operated and basically snuck everything in, in bits and pieces. What they did back in uh, 1871 or 1868, whatever, with the 14th Amendment, didn't necessarily benefit the guys that were alive at that point in time. But it set the stage for down the road for their fraternal organization or society to control the people later on. That's all they want is the power. And then they've got all their games that basically they can uh, deceive people from their money, like the game of taxes, like the game of traffic tickets, like the game of uh, whatever, because the people don't know how to play the game. They don't know how to order the set-off or the cancellation of those items, that they're all in fraud. So, hopefully that gives you a little understanding of how to take care of your receipts to turn around and you do a court ruling, a court judgment, that basically these are to be set off and paid out of the mutual uh, insurance policy.
the one key thing that really sort of turned me on to uh, this was uh, when I got a call from the Social Security Administration about uh, three, four weeks ago, and basically I was trying to terminate my Social Security account. Well, basically just like a whole life insurance policy that I borrowed money from, They wanted what I had borrowed plus interest. And I said, wait a minute. That was my money to begin with. I deposited it. Why do I have to pay interest upon my own money? See, that's some of the type questions that you people have to really ask to base to get a good understanding of what is really going on. In a lot of cases, most of the people have been asking the wrong question. The wrong why. And then they've been going to all the codes which do not apply to them to try and find remedy. Your remedy is real simple. You hold your court, you make the judgment, and then you issue your order. You know what is right and wrong. They don't. They're only trying to operate for their benefit. Now, hopefully that wakes you up a little to the understanding of how this court system really operates and what true remedies you have. I'll reiterate that again. The title of your court is the Your Name Territorial Estate and it should be basically the name that is on your certificate of live birth U.S. Superior Court, having the lawful territorial estate jurisdiction. You were born with a territorial estate. Because you are a territory. Hold up your right hand and your left hand and stick out your index fingers to the right and to the left. I've said this before. Basically, that finger now basically is your meets and bounds of your territory, your bodily bodily territory. In the late 60s or early 70s, basically they called it something else. My space. You entered into my space. That was my territory. You're only allowed into that territory when you come in peace and in most cases for sex. Otherwise, you keep your distance. And like I said, your court oath is basically very simple. I swear to tell the truth. And see, the beneficiaries cannot take that oath in your court. So you don't even have to worry about them ever coming into your court 
or even being present, you know right offhand that they can't tell the truth because they don't know the truth. And even if they did know the truth, they definitely ain't going to tell it. Because their head is on the chopping block. Just like John the Baptist. They can't spill the trade secret. We've had enough court documents out here, okay? So basically there should be more than enough templates up there on the group site for you guys to take a look at and utilize them in some means of your court documents. And even in the means of court orders. You can even go in and find out, uh, get a listing of what court orders have been issued out. And in a lot of cases, uh, when it comes from the clerk of the court issuing the court order out to these different entities, it can either be by mail Certified mail, regular mail, confirmed by the clerk of the court signing the document, by fax, or by email. I've seen all three of those items that you can check on court orders that I've gotten about traffic tickets. from the clerk of the court. But you have to address yourself as the clerk of your court, like in my case, the Patrick Divine Territorial Estate, U.S. Superior Court. See, we never used U.S. Superior Court in any of our documents before. And you'll never see a U.S. Superior Court in the court system because that belongs to us, the people. That is the true people's court. Now, for your apostilles, like I said, you have to basically issue the documents under your court as a your court document, U.S. court document. Then you can send them to the federal district courts to be apostilled or to the Secretary of the State to be apostilled. But they have to be under a court order. Now, the warrants also if you're going to send one of those into the treasurer, you have to come in under a court order to go along with that warrant. Ordering them to process it. See, they need to have the order. These guys do not operate unless they have an order. 
the warrant itself is not the order. The order has to come from the court. Okay. I think I'm pretty much done there. Go ahead and open it up for questions, Tom. Uh, anybody can unmute star six and unmute yourself and ask a question if you got them. Okay. I have a question. If a uh, beneficiary can't show up, do we still have to issue a summons or a notice to them that we're no. holding session? No. You know, right offhand, see, this is a discretionary court that you're operating in. Look up the definition of discretionary. Discretion, okay? The equitable decision of what is just and proper under the circumstances. The liberty and power of acting without other control than one's own judgment. The power or right conferred upon an officer of acting officially under circum certain circumstances according to the dictates of his own judgment and conscience uncontrolled by the judgment and conscience of others. And you can also read discretionary trust. Yes, it's a trust, but I don't see discretionary judgment in Valentine's. That must be in um, Blacks or Edgerson's. What? Discretionary judgment is not in Valentine's. No, discretion. Okay. Look up just the word discretion. Okay. And then basically it's a discretionary trust. Also, because, because... this is, it's, it, we, the state of Iowa discretionary in trust incorporated territory. Mm. And see, they're operating under dis, their discretionary control over this entrusted incorporated territory. Right, where they don't have to consult us. Right, and basically, they uh, come up with their own rules and regulations upon whether uh, the statute of limitation has expired or not. Like there is no statute of limitation upon fraud, and this whole thing is based upon fraud, an an intention to deceive you of your assets and control you in the process. Now, if that's not fraud, I don't know what is. That's their state secret, trade secret. But you just have to start putting the words together in the process. And see, you can issue a writ of D-E-T-I-N-U-E to the U.S. Marshals because you're coming in from a U.S. Superior Court. So we can do these our own guys, of the system. These guys have been waiting for us to wake up to so we come can do in, our own in our court capacity. Okay. Can you spell that D E T U? D E T I N U E. D E T I N U E. You two know that. A common law remedy for the recovery in species of chattels wrongfully withheld from the plaintiff. 
Is the N between the E and the U? D E T I E E Delta Echo Thomas Irving Nancy I don't know. Urban U D E. Okay. D. Okay, I got you. Delta Tango Echo November. You don't have to repeat it. Okay, U E. Okay, I got it. I just want to look. Yeah, it up. look it up in the dictionary. All right. Okay. I mentioned it on the call the other night. I know. I don't think I wrote it correctly then either. Well, basically, get it in the dictionary, and basically, you'll find when you try and find the word, even if you misspelled it. You go down through until you find something that sounds like right in the definition. Right, right. And then in looking down through there, you start finding other words. You guys got to use the dictionary mm -hmm. because the Bible told you to. Until you know the words, you can't use the words. It's all in the Word. Is there a particular reason why you call it the U dot S dot ter you know? Because that's what they have in that one document. Okay. Okay? <laughs> Separating it from the federal system. From the okay. federal courts. U dot S dot stands really for the United States of America. Okay. When used in one scenario. But see, you have to read what is the attached words that are around it to know which court system you're really talking about. Right, it doesn't include the word district. No, it doesn't include the word federal. Okay. The district courts are called out. The territorial courts are called out. Okay. The circuit courts are called out. The Supreme Court's called out. But the federal courts are not called out in the Constitution. And then, see, you are an American territory, a free American territory. But they got you incorporated into the state. Even though you were born within that state, you are a territory, a body territory that is free to roam throughout the whole United States. That means you can't be bound to one state. Does it? Right. Yeah. You can't be free if you're bound to one state. What do they call that? An oxymoron? <laughs> yep. The use of words that don't make sense together. Yeah. Dissolution of a corporation, the breaking up. Winding up. A lot of these words, basically, you just need to take a look at. Clerk. You need to really look at, see what it says about a clerk. And then a clerk of the court. Decision. 
an adjudication by the court without formulating the result in a judgment. So you can issue a court order by the decision of the court. You don't have to necessarily have a formal judgment. See, that would come into play with your uh, receipts. Hmm. So you got to think outside the box. You got to start really thinking, okay? I know it's hard for a lot of people out here because you've been groomed not to do it. To go along to get along. And see, these were created as, uh, if you look up benevolent or benevolent or whatever the hell word is. Benevolent. Benevolent. Corporation. A non-profit corporation. An E L E E M O S Y N A R Y corporation. Well, then you need to look up what that means. Okay? And a corporation created for and devoted to charitable purposes or one or supported by charity. A corporation created not for private gain or profit, but for the administration of a charitable trust or for a charitable purpose, such as the maintenance of a hospital. Well, see, in a lot of ways, when Roosevelt set this thing up, these mutual beneficial items, they were set up with that intent. But then he started finding out how they were operating these things, and he got killed. A lot of people don't know that he was shot. Closed coffin and everything else. Some guys do things with good intention and then turn around and find out that their good intention turned around and backfired on them. Woodrow Wilson. Even Eisenhower, and he was a real shithead to begin with, but that was beside the point. He realized that basically he unleashed the military juggernaut in this country. Are you saying Teddy Roosevelt got shot or FDR? FDR. Yeah. Yeah, even the guy that shot uh, uh, old Ronald Reagan. Basically, he was an MK Ultra uh, plant that was a Bush family member. Right. In fact, uh, at the, at the the night before Reagan got shot. John Hinckley's brother was having uh, dinner with another one of Bush's brothers. Yeah, because they're all in the family. Yeah. They were cousins. And Stalin was demanding an autopsy for uh, FDR.
Yeah, because he didn't want Truman in power. Right. Because Truman was totally with the bankers. Absolutely. Okay, any other questions on what I went over tonight? And only questions on that. Yes, I have a question. Okay. You, we're talking about a beneficial corporation, uh, benevolent corporation, sorry. Um, so is that the title for the tribunal, or um, how does that relate to us? I told you how it related to us, okay? We signed a mutual uh, easement. Okay? We are a territorial estate by birth. An American territorial estate. Our body is an American. And we have a territorial body. We have land. Our body is made up of land. So we are a territory. And we have an estate. And we were given assets in the country, our inheritance. But we deposited our inheritance under a mutual easement under our fictional person being the grantor and us the grantee under a servitude to the state who became the beneficiary because if you have a grantor and a grantee, you have to have a beneficiary. And the state became the major beneficiary. The grantee was supposed to be the beneficiary, but they got us also under a servitude to them, a false servitude, because the people didn't know how to stand up and become free. We were only supposed to be in that servitude until we turned 21. And then we had to come in with a mutual will for our grantor and us as the grantee and terminate, liquidate that mutual fund life insurance policy or mutual uh, life insurance policy. which was holding our account in a special fund. So this mutual will, it doesn't sound very much different from the writ of the tenure. So I guess is it the same thing? Like I said, the document is up there for a joint and mutual will that you have to submit this will into your court. Your court is the one that's going to make the judgment on that will. Then out of your court judgment, you direct your clerk of the court to issue an order to whoever, like the attorney general, to shut down that mutual uh, life insurance policy because he's a trustee over those mutual uh, life insurance policies. And then if they don't comply, then you can issue the order to the U.S. District Court of the United States of America. And so is it at that point that you would issue the writ to the district court? You would issue a writ of detent, or whatever that word is. Detent what? That's the writ that I would issue, not a writ of replevin or anything like that. Okay, so I have one last question. 
as far yeah. as uh, as far as where the funds are deposited, I guess they're supposed to contact us to set up the uh, treasury account for our funds, and then if they don't comply, then we can issue the writ. Well, basically, they will probably be bringing when you terminate this thing under your court order. They will be bringing your assets in gold-backed mirror bonds. Now it's up to you what you want to do with them. You at that point in time can turn around and put them into the de jure treasury of the United States of America, getting them completely out of the control of the DTC. See, there's other outfits out here that have been operating this way for years. The Amish, they basically never got incorporated into the state because they do not have state uh, certificates of live birth. But they do have their uh, recording into the Book of Life at the county land records so that they can lawfully claim their American inheritance. And probably only several of the elders in their church or their society knows the whole fact about that. Hmm. Just like in a lot of cases, the Mormons out there. It's only the upper echelon that basically know what is really going on in this process. Like the old story goes about King Solomon. Okay? How did he get as rich as he became? Because he married, I don't know how many, thousand women and he claimed their dowries that he took a little bit of that dowries that he had and set them up in a place that basically they had all their wants and needs and then put a bunch of eunuchs around there so that basically they were happy But he got all their assets. Then he got the wealth to take control of everything. To go out and fund different items. You got to read between the lines of what the Bible is really trying to tell you. It's like an ocean. It has a lot of depth to it. Not really. Once you start clearing the fog off the ocean, basically now you can see what the hell's out there. You've got to get rid of the fog. Fill in the holes that are out there. And that's what. that's why I kept trying to tell people it's called the Holy Bible because it's full of holes and you have to fill the holes in. Just like the Passover, okay? The Holy Ghost passed over the Hebrews. But basically, there's a word that's missing. The Holy Ghost passed over to the Hebrews their inheritance, their wages, everything. 
when they terminated their contracts. And that's what they were doing when they put the red cross or mark upon their house. They were terminating their contracts. Jesus did the same thing. He crucified his contracts. I think I went over that Friday night. Yes. About the good thief and the bad thief. The clue of that is the guy's name, Barbarus, means son of God or something. Barbarus or whatever. Yes. Okay, any other questions on this from anybody else? Yeah, I have another question. Okay. <laughs> okay, so let me just try to summarize what's been said. So with this executive warrant and order, that will is to be submitted into the territorial estate court, and then the territorial estate court issues an order to process the warrant and deposit the assets into the treasury. Deposit the assets into your back pocket. Well, it's just that earlier your PDF had a deposit into well, your treasury Well, the warrant account. that basically... No, no. The warrant that I have that's going on the back of the certificate of live birth for cash value, Stephen Lynch, that, that's coming back to you. Okay? When you terminate the item, then you're going to issue the writ of this uh, detent to the Attorney General. Because you don't know how much value there is in that account. Right. You're going to close down the insurance policy. Give me the whole damn thing. <laughs> See, you've got to think about this. Don't mix and match it, okay? This is what has been the major problem with people out here over the years. They hear something, and they're off and running, and they're mixing two items that should not be put together. Because they're being put together inappropriately. Now, if you want $100,000 from the treasurer of the state, you have a court order directing that from your court. Now, you put have your clerk of the court put that order out, and then you make the warrant to process the order and send a copy of both of those to the state treasurer. Now he has the order and the warrant to go along with it. But if you're closing down the whole account, then you do that writ of detenue and the court order. Signed by your clerk of the court, based upon your court ruling. <clears throat> and you're going to have to set up your own court uh, uh, record file, because you want your item to be a private court of record. Okay, so let me see if I got that. You put you put in the will, and then this uh, becomes a writ of detenue for which the clerk submits a warrant and sends to the attorney general. 
You put in the will into the court. Now, you as the judge rule and make your judgment for the will of the grantor and the grantee. Now you have the judgment. Now, the judge turns around and directs the clerk of the court to issue an order. You ever been to court before? Yeah. And how does the court operate? The judge makes a judgment call. Then he basically sends the judgment down to, and part of the judgment is to issue an order, have the clerk of the court issue an order. The clerk of the court issues the order out to you to pay the traffic ticket. Or whatever. But see, you didn't even need to get that far because basically that court is a bar member of the fraternal society that is overseeing our accounts. And you come in as a superior court into that court and you order that inferior court to settle the item from the insurance policy or you come in as the governor of the territory and you pardon that completely off the books. Okay, it it makes sense to me now. And I guess we were talking about on Friday this executive warrant, I guess that's a totally separate thing for immediate relief. Is yeah, that right? That, that was for basically getting cash out from the treasurer, okay, to do that on the back of the, uh, that it was not uh, there to terminate the account. But you have to, to get that warrant to get processed through the treasurer of the state, you have to supply them with a court order to go along with the warrant. I was trying to do both on one document, but I see that it can't be done. The order has to come from our court, and then basically the warrant is from our governor. You have the capability of many different hats in this process, all operating under the same name or similar name. It's like you went out and started up a corporation and then you only hired Tom Joneses to work there. but they're not all operating the same office or the same responsibilities. They each have their own area of expertise, of authority, but they're all Tom Joneses. And that's one of the problems that most people have is trying to wrap their mind around this in this process. And you definitely do not want to be an individual out here. because, And that's what basically they try and get you in all of their court actions is to be an individual. An individual is claimed to be a nomad. 
one who has uh, no claim to anything. He's just a roamer. Yeah, I saw in Valentine's there was a phrase that said, the church is more to be preferred than the individual. Yes, and see, that's basically also what the court is. And basically, you're coming in under uh, your court and God. See, they can't use God in their court system. They could probably get away with using the devil, but basically they're not going to do that because that would totally expose them. But that's their God. And an oath of truth. Okay, I have one last clarification I want to ask. Okay. So we need to get the three executive seals of authority if you want to. Can I hear you? Okay, we need to get the three executive seals of authority. So we want the apostille, and now for the Hague Convention, we're going to the federal court to get that apostille. So should we issue an order to the federal district court to get that apostille yes. for us? Yes. You have to turn your documents into uh, your U.S. Superior Court documents first. Okay, that these documents are issued out of your superior court. U.S. Superior Court. Now, since they came from a U.S. court, then they can be processed by the federal court system. Also by the Secretary of State. But there again, you have to put an order to go along with them. You give them the order to apostille these. Okay? Okay, and we can do the same with the county if we don't have our county land record. Is that right? If you don't have your what? The county land record where our document was recorded. Your, you mean your book and page number or whatever? Yeah, sure. Well, basically you uh, go through and uh, uh, the Secretary of State, you can basically put the pressure upon them. See, those county recorders all work under the jurisdiction of that Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. Who controls all the seals for the state? The Secretary of State. So basically that county recorder's office seal is also controlled by the Secretary of the State. Okay, and would that go under a writ of certiorari? You can just put it as a regular court order to them. Right up your own. Okay. Doesn't need to be a writ every time. Okay? It can be a straight order. I mean, you go to McDonald's, you don't give them a writ. You give them an order. I'm not really trying to be Lily, but I'm trying to get you to think, okay? Okay. That's what you really got to do is start thinking, okay? And that's the big problem with most people out here. They really want somebody else to tell them what to think. <laughs> it's the truth. And I'm not going to do that. You've got to do your own thinking. 
I can't think for you. Just like I can't shit for you. <laughs> There's certain things that everybody has to do on their own. I'm just trying to keep you on the track that you need to be on. Just like Jesus tried to came for one reason and one reason only. To show us the way and the path to be on, to come out of the system. But everybody's polluted that and because uh, that really didn't sell, and truth never sells, okay? Deception, fraud, killing, blood and guts, that really sells. And basically, that's what everybody loves to see. So basically, they rewrote the story to incorporate all that blood and guts. And basically, the people have bought this for well over 2,000 years. Never did make any sense. And I started seeing that when I was five years old. And see, that's when, uh, in a lot of cases, about that time frame, that's why in a lot of the cartoons that are out here that are directed to the children, you'll find a hell of a lot of truth. But the parents and the teachers have messed the the kids' minds up after that. Throwing conflicting information out there against what really should be the truth. Because they don't know the truth, and they only think they know what the truth is, because that's what they were led to believe. And you definitely don't go against your grandparents because, oh, shit, basically you're, you're now bad-mouthing your parental lineage. You're not giving honor to your father and mother anymore. That's not what that really meant. Let's see, people don't even understand that one. Okay, any other questions? Hopefully this uh, shows you that basically this, the process was simple. Really, when it comes down to it, we just had to stand up as our own court. In a lot of cases, they've been doing, allowing us, and some cases, we've said the right things in one court and got a remedy, and then we go to another court and we get into an argumentative scenario and we don't get any remedy because we're not standing as a competent court of jurisdiction any longer. Patrick, you said that we're a competent court, and a competent court is a de facto court. Right. I thought we were a de de jure court. No, a de let me see what the hell to say. Uh, where in the hell is that competent court? He was comparing our court as a court of truth and being competent in truth compared to them being de facto and not in truth. It's, it's a court created without color of authority, not a mere usurper. Yeah, de facto means with color of authority. De jure means without color of authority. 
Okay. Uh, a court created without power of authority, but a mere usurper is not within the definition. But a de facto court is a competent court. Yeah, it has the word fact in it. Okay, see, people sort of messed up the definition of de facto and de jure out here so long. Just don't worry about that. Just think about a competent court having that basically you are without color of authority and you're not a you're not you a court created okay but you're a competent court a tribunal having jurisdiction leave it at that okay good forget the rest of the definition basically that's what half the time people get screwed up on is the rest of the definition and they miss out on the very first part out of the Item, a tribunal having jurisdiction. Stop right there. You are a tribunal and you have jurisdiction. And when you are of age, you are competent. You can look up competent person. A person, a capable person, a person legally qualified by age and mental capacity. Competent jurisdiction, the power and authority of law at the time of acting to do a particular act. Board of competent jurisdiction. See, competent jurisdiction. And I just read you what competent jurisdiction said. And then it's got to have a competent person in the judge's seat. Okay, that makes sense. It's fairly important not to have the word competent next to the word court, just for that reason, though. Huh? It seems that it would be very important not to have the word competent next to the word court for that very reason. Well, basically, if you just think of a competent court as a tribunal having jurisdiction. Right. And leave off the rest of the definition that's there. <laughs> Because, see, none of those, they're all based upon writings that came out of a court case. Mm -hmm. None of that, for a competent court, is out of uh, the American jurisprudence. A lot of the stuff about competent is just based upon what some other court made a discretionary decision. Mm. So these court sites could actually end up clouding the issue? In some cases, yes. Okay. That's what you have to look at. Where did this definition really come from? Does it make real sense? Does it hold water? If it leaks, then it ain't worth shit. Hmm. And I don't know how many times that's in the damn movies. Does it hold water? I know I've heard that in several movies. Oh, yeah. Okay, another question. Are we still using an ecclesiastical notary, or is it now a court notary? We're going to use the clerk of the court. Our superior court, clerk.
clerk of the court. So he has to notarize it. Huh? So any order that we issue, it has to be notarized by the clerk of the court? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, but we're the clerk of the court. Yes. Yeah, you're one of the Tom Joneses in that corporation that you're operating. There's a song that says that. I'm every woman. <laughs> yeah. Now there's also the song The Name Game, too. You can come up with different names if you want to do that. Just run them through your court. This is the name of my clerk of the court. They all know the difference. But you better have it in your records. So that basically, if they question you, you can say, well, here, I've got a document in my court record. That the name of my clerk of the court is Sam Jones. I just keep it simple and just keep using the same name or same uh, semblance of your name in all the different capacities. And you can always justify that pretty easy. But if you put a different name on there, then basically you're going to have to have some documentation uh, to cover that. Okay, any other questions? Oh, I have one more question. (laughs) Um, We're going to have to steal our ID documents with the federal courts again. Is that right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Instead of uh, the ecclesiastic, change it to uh, your clerk of the court. Your superior clerk of the court, or your clerk of your superior court, however you want to phrase it. U U dot S dot superior court. And maybe put the whole title down there. Uh, clerk of the court for uh, the court for the Patrick Divine, uh, in my case, uh, territorial U dot S dot superior court. That way you don't leave anything to doubt. Okay, thank you so much, Patrick. Okay. Okay, is that it? Uh, looks like it, then, Patrick. Thank okay. you very much. We'll talk to you guys later. We'll get to work okay. on this. Thank you. Okay, good night. Bye.